This morning we are finishing a short series on remembering who we are as a church and the things that are truly the essentials for Sheridan Hills in this day and time. You know, there are many churches that because of cultural Christianity, um, they kind of know that there's many church members or know that they're supposed to go to church and so they come to church and they know there's a few things that they're supposed to do and they know some basic truths of the gospel perhaps, but they don't really know what are the most important things in the life of the church. I believe that any institution and any organization really needs to know its mission, and it really needs to know its most heralded values, its most important pillars of, of foundation that are there. And this morning we are finishing this message where we've been looking at these four key words in the life of the church. Um, the very first one that we, that we studied a few weeks ago was the, the word community. Community And Pastor Ben kicked us off. He started us off in this study of community. And I want you to notice here um, and put a check mark next to the word community um, and notice the paragraph that is under that. Um, and I, I want you to see it starts off with, we are not designed. So if you're on the front side, you may need to flip it over. You want to see the, the paragraph that says, we are not designed to live in isolation. So as our part of review, let's see that. We are not designed to live in isolation, but in relationship with one another. Relating within a close community of fellow believers allows us to identify with, trust, support, and care for each other. The idea of community is incredibly important to us for those reasons. Look at this. Through these connections, we can spur one another on in our relationship with Christ in the fulfillment of His commands. Uh, we looked at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and verse 25. I'd like to ask you to read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25 out loud with me. So uh, let's read that together. It starts off with, and let us. Let's read together. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You see, there's a day that's coming. There's a day that's coming where we can't do this anymore because we're going to go into the next era of God's grand plan. We want to be faithful in this day. And the way that Christians remain faithful in this day is to walk with the body of Christ together. I just simply, the, the, the longer I'm a Christian, the longer I'm a pastor, the more I see that there really is no place for a Christian without a church. Christians are to be in the body of Christ. This is God's design, and this is the beauty of the idea of community. He has made us for relationship. He has made us to be a people that relate and care for one another. You know, it's interesting to me that in the United Nations, we recognize that solitary confinement, strict solitary confinement where a human is held in captivity with no contact with other human, with other, without contact with other humans is considered what? Do you know what it's considered? Cruel and inhumane treatment, otherwise known as torture. Now think about that. Strict solitary confinement is torture for the human. Do you know why? Because God has made us relational. And some of you would say, well, I'm not sure that my husband is that way. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not, he would love to be in solitary confinement. He tells me to leave him alone all the time. No, I, I know that you, some of us are more relational than others a little bit, but the picture is this that God has made us relational, and, and the church is the greatest place of relationship because the greatest bond that we could ever have is God is our Heavenly Father. And so it's an important thing for us to recognize that Sheridan Hills sees community as highly important. This is one of the reasons that we've been talking about growth groups on Sunday morning, a time for you to come and get to know other people in a setting that's a much smaller setting than this. You, you hardly get to know anyone in this setting. 
It's, it's very difficult to become um, friends with others in this setting, though this setting is incredibly important. The church assembled together. But it's in the small groups as well where we begin to really see another type of worship and community as we are relating to one another. We have growth groups and we also have community groups that are geographically based around the city. We want you to get to know one another, those who live not 30 minutes away through traffic, but those who live around the corner from your house. So for members of our church, we're encouraging you to, to get to know one another and care for one another. This week, um, I found out about a lady in our church that fell and broke her pelvis and um, has not been in contact with anyone for three weeks in the life of the church. Now, there's a couple of things there. Um, if you're coming to this church, we can't get to know you if you don't let us do that. And so we're providing every opportunity for you to dive in and get to know one another. Occasionally, this happens. I will meet someone after the service, and I will shake hands with them, and they'll say, hello, and they'll say, who are you? And I'll say, well, my name's Andrew Coleman. Oh, really? Great. What do you do here? Well, <laughs> I'm the pastor of one of the pastors of the church. Oh, you are? Oh, great. And how long have you been coming to our church? 14 years, 18 years, you know, or whatever it is. And, it, you know, if we don't know one another, it's not just me, but it's one another, we are, not, we are not passing this very, very important test of the Christian life, of being in relationship with one another. The very next message that we looked at was mission. And I want you to see this. Um, I preached this message three weeks ago. Um, notice here the statement that is here. If you want to know what's important to, Christian, to Sheridan Hills, mission is also important. Look what it says under mission. Jesus has commanded us to go and make fully devoted followers of him both locally and globally. It is our task to proclaim the entire message of Christ to the entire world. Every tribe, every language, every people, and every nation must hear that the Savior has died for their sins and been raised to life so that they too may live. Our mission is what? Let's read that last sentence out loud. Our mission is the Great Commission. That was very weak. Let's try it again. Our mission is the Great Commission. What is the Great Commission? It's right here in Matthew 28. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Last week, we looked at the top um, word, the word truth. And uh, Pastor Ben brought this message. Notice with me here the principle of truth or the, the great value, the core value of truth. And it begins with Psalm 43.3. Notice what it says. Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. You see, that's what truth does for sinful humans. Truth brings sinful humans to God. That's what it does. This is God's desire that we would come and to know the truth. Notice the next sentence that's there. If you want life, you must have truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You see, where there is truth, it is God's truth. And it always leads to freedom and life for those who receive it. All our hope is in the truth of God as revealed in Scripture. We seek to study it, to learn it, to believe it, and what? Obey it. Obey it. And so Jeremiah 15, 16 is one of my favorite passages about truth. Look what it says. Your words were found, and I ate them. Your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. So, truth, community, mission. There's one more for us, and that's the one that we see today. And notice there, right there on your outline, the word worship. This morning we come to this idea of worship, and we'll be looking at worship that is acceptable to God. Notice this before you turn your sheet over. Let's look and see the synopsis that's here. There is no higher calling, and there is no greater joy 
than worshiping the living God in spirit and in truth. Far more than a weekly service is living moment by moment in the glorious grace of a generous God. Ultimate satisfaction is only found in Him. And then here is our text for this morning, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual what? Worship. Worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So if you were, turn your sheet over, and let's look, and let's see this idea of worship for just a few moments. There are 10 important statements about worship, and we see the idea of them um, in this passage uh, in part, but I just want you to overview and see with me 10 key concepts concerning worship that are very, very um, critical for a church and for a Christian to understand. And the first one is this, that throughout the Bible, we see that there is that There is worship that is accepted by God and worship that is, fill it in, not accepted by God. You see, there is some worship that God accepts and there is some worship that God does not accept. Now, that may not be very politically correct to say in this day and time or if we wanted to call it theologically correct to say in this day and time, but you know, the Bible isn't very politically correct and it's not very, very... Uh, interested in what all humanity thinks about these issues. The Bible is God's Word that tells us how to think on these issues, and the Bible makes very clear that just because you're worshiping doesn't mean that you're worshiping correctly. If you have your Bible, you can go over and look with me in Genesis chapter 4. This is very easy to find. It's the beginning of your Bible. Go with me to Genesis chapter 4. And the amazing thing is We see creation made good all perfectly, Genesis 1 and 2, and then very quickly we get to Genesis 3, which talks about the fall. And when we come to Genesis 3 and we see the fall, we see that humanity falls into the vortex of sin in all of its consequences. And this great sinful state that we come into is manifested in the first few human beings that are born on the earth. In Genesis chapter 4, we see Cain and Abel in the story of Abel's life. If you're making a note, you may want to put off to the side the word Abel. Do you know what the word Abel means in Hebrew? It means breath. It means like a vapor. Now, what's interesting about this is that Abel was born to his mother Eve and to his father Adam. He is murdered by his brother, so he has no lineage, he has no children that carry on who he is and who his name is as as a person. He was but a breath. He He was born and then he was gone. But God works and tells us about his death, and more importantly, we see about his life and his worship, which was accepted by God. Notice the screen or in your Bible. Look in Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 through 5, and it says, in verse 3, it says, in the course of time, Cain brought, in the course of time, Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground, And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions, or the best portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel in his offering, verse 5, but for Cain in his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell, or his countenance fell. So here, even here in, the, in just the fourth chapter of the Bible, 
The first time we see a sacrifice being brought to God, a, a worship offering being brought to God, we see the difference between that which is accepted and that which is not accepted by God. And we can see a few clues in this. If you look at chapter 4 of Genesis, you see that Cain's offering, and notice the screen in front of you, it simply says that Cain brought an offering. There's no indication that it was a special offering. It was just out of what he had. He came and just brought something from what he had. And we, as we begin to see how God works, as we begin to see what God is valuing, valuing and not only that, the, the covering that was provided for their parents was a, was a covering that came from a live sacrifice. If you think about it with me, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 3 that God brought the skins of an animal and covered Adam and Eve after they had sinned because they were ashamed. They, their eyes were open. They were ashamed in their nakedness. And so God comes and he provides a covering for them in their state of sin. And that is the first reference to death in the Bible anywhere. The first reference to death is the implied death of animals that their skin would cover, their, 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 uh, would provide a covering, a clothing for the covering of Adam and Eve. A precursor, a view to the sacrifice that would cover their sin through Christ. A life that would be shed, blood that would be shed for the coming Messiah. And so, here in Cain's offering, he brings fruit of the ground. There's no doubt that there's certain other offerings that are fruit of the ground that, that we see in the Old Testament law. But here, it was simply an offering, nothing noted special. But look with me in the next verse, in verse 4. While Abel brought, what does it say there? The best portions were the fat portions, those were the best portions of what? The firstborn of the flock. So here, the first fruit of the flock, the first part of the flock, Abel is bringing a sacrifice that truly costs something. And it's a representation of the coming Messiah that would bring a right relationship with God. So his, his worship is a worship that is accepted by God. In 1 Kings, we can see the story of Elijah um, versus the prophets of Baal. One sole prophet calling upon God and offering sacrifice to God, which God accepts that sacrifice. 450 prophets of Baal calling out, yes, in worship, but to a different God and we see that that worship is not accepted. In John chapter 4, we see another key aspect of worship, and we see it when Jesus sits down next to a well, and there's a Samaritan woman that is there. 800 years earlier, the Jews of Samaria had intermingled and intermarried with other people who had come into the land, and so they weren't really pure Jews. They had, they had gone against the commands of God, and they had intermarried with other nations. And in fact, not only had they intermarried with other nations, but they had come up with their own place of worship because they were no longer accepted as those who could worship in Jerusalem. So they had a different mountain. In fact, they had even changed the scriptures. They had their own set of scriptures uh, that had been altered. And so they were really, they were really not accepted by the Jews, but here is part of the picture of Jesus coming and having a discussion about worship with a Samaritan woman. Now, it's truly amazing that a Jewish man would sit down and speak with a Jewish woman um, there that he does not know in public. You just did not do that in that day and time. And so Jesus, elevating the status of women in exalting that, in going through that barrier, Jesus sits down and speaks with her. You know, wherever the gospel truly goes, the status of women increases. 
I mean, I, I can tell you after living in several nations of the world where the gospel is exalted, the condition and the status of women is, increases, is increased. It's a beautiful thing to see that God exalts that and God brings about a health and a humanity that is right and good. But here we see in John chapter 4 that Jesus sits down and he has a discussion with a woman. And uh, we're going to save that passage for after point number two. Look at point number two. Worship that is accepted by God is often called true worship. When you study the Bible, you see the difference between that worship that is accepted and not accepted. It is, it is called true worship. And we see a picture of this in John chapter 4. If you have your Bible, you're welcome to turn there, or you can look as well on the screen in front of you. Notice on the screen in front of you, in John chapter 4, Jesus says to the woman at the well, as uh, she immediately brings up a question about who's right, the Jews or the Samaritans? So she brings up a pressing issue on her mind. In verse 21, he says, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me that the hour is coming when neither on this mountain, the mountain she was saying we should worship at, nor in Jerusalem, that's the mountain of the Jews, nor in Jer Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Verse 22, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is of the Jews. This was simply God's plan. This was God's design that through the Jews would come the Messiah. Look at verse 23. But the hour is coming and is now here, he says to her, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in what? In spirit and in truth. So, the worship that God is really after is not a worship that is caught up in religious controversy with all of the trappings of religion and the ideas of man. That is not what God is really after. We begin to see here early in the Gospel of John that Jesus is talking about a true worship. So as he begins to preach the Gospel, as he begins to live out the Gospel of God to the world that's around them, before he goes to the cross, as he begins to explain what God really wants, he starts breaking down all the preconceived ideas about what worship is. And he starts to say to them, no, 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 listen, true worshipers, look what it says in the middle of verse 23, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Those two words are stated two times. When the Bible repeats something, it's very often it's good for us to pay special attention and look at, at what is being said. And so what we begin to see is that God is saying it is the heart, it is the attitude, it is the being that is important. Your spirit in, in worshiping God down in the core of not what man sees on the outside, but what God sees on the inside, and God knows the truth on the inside, this is the worship that God is seeking. He's not looking for the people who look good on the outside. He's not looking for the people who seem to have it all together and know just the right verses or just the right way or just the right clothes or just the right things, but he's looking for true worshipers who in spirit, in the core of who they are, down in who he has made them to be, are worshiping honestly before him, not in pretense and not in foolishness. So this is the grand difference between religion and relationship with God. So verse two, or point number two on our outline is, worship that is accepted by God is often called true worship, and we see that in John chapter four. Look at number, number three that's here. Worship that is not accepted by God, it's false worship or idolatry. Worship that is not accepted by God is false worship or idolatry. We see this throughout the Bible. We see it throughout the Old Testament, and we see it touched on throughout the New Testament exactly as Jesus has just done in, in John chapter 4. Now, remember with me, what is the first commandment? 
that is given to Moses in Exodus 19? What is the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I mean, at the very basis of the Ten Commandments is this idea that there are to be no other gods before me. I am the only one you are to worship, God is saying to his people. There are no other gods, there are no other things, there are no other idols that you are to have. And so when we begin to worship other things, even when we begin to worship religious behavior, when we begin to worship anything other than the Spirit of God through the truth of God, then we are exalting other idols. Did you know that it is possible within a Bible teaching church that is committed to the gospel, it is possible to have idolatry? It is possible for us here at Sheridan Hills to have idolatry. When we begin to exalt and we begin to look up and we begin to see anything that is other than God, you see, Sheridan Hills could, we could worship our past. We could worship, oh, we're such a great church, you know, we planted other churches, we did these things, whatever. Before very long, you could, you could make it about Sheridan Hills more than you make it about God. There are some Christians who can, who can make their family heritage really the thing that they worship. You know, my great and godly grandmother, every time you get together, they talk about, if you, if you ask anything about um, their Christian life or whatever, they start talking about their grandparents, or they start talking about, you know, someone else or something else in their life, or sometimes it's an experience that they had. And it's possible to begin to worship, you know, when I went away on this mission trip and it changed my life and this, and, and, and as good as a mission trip is, as good as Sheridan Hills may be, as good and as wonderful as your godly grandmother may have been, you can begin to worship something other than the Savior of your soul. And that is, a very prone, that, that is something that humans are very prone to do, to begin to worship other things than God. So true worship that is accepted by God is true worship. Worship that is not accepted by God is false worship or idolatry, and it's a very real possibility in us all around us, even as Christians in this day and time. We could fall prey to it. Look at number four in Fill the Sin. The human heart, circle the word heart, the human heart was made by God to worship. He's made us for worship. In fact, fill this in, it always worships something. Your heart is always worshiping something. My heart is always worshiping something. We were made for worship. It's, it's what we do. You say, well, I, I don't know. If it, I, Pastor, I don't think that I'm worshiping anything when I wake up in the morning before my cup of coffee. I know what you mean. I, I, I get that. I'm, I'm not talking about the, that, that moment in that necessarily. I don't want to dissect that entirely. I mean, I understand my brain is in neutral until, you know, I, I get going a little bit. Um, very often, though, when I wake up in the morning, quite honestly, by God's grace, I my first thoughts of the day are of his mercy and of his goodness and his greatness, and very often I find myself saying, Lord, thank you for this new day. Thank you as I'm getting out of bed. May I live for you today. May I honor you today. May I exalt you today. That's a good thing. If God gives you the grace to, to, to have those thoughts, it's not good to run to the worries or the, the problems or the, the other things or what all you're going to do. It's, it's good to let your opening moments be in worship to him. We can, we can do that. But in the big picture of our hearts and the affections of our hearts, we need to understand that the heart is not neutral ground when it comes to God. You've often heard it said this way, that as um, a person, you, as a Christian, you're either moving closer to the Lord or moving further from Him at all, the, at all times. I believe that to be true. I believe that our hearts are either actively pursuing the Lord, and when we're not actively pursuing Him, we are drifting from Him. 
This is the reason it's so important for us to embrace Christian disciplines. This is the reason it's so important for us to embrace Christian community. This is the reason it's so important for us to embrace all the things that God has called us to do and commanded us to do, as such as Bible reading, knowing the Scripture, falling in love with what He's given, spending time in prayer, falling in love with His people and, and serving and rejoicing in the people that are around us, that are in Him. So, the human heart is always going to worship something. Look at number five. The question is not, and this really goes with number four, the question is not if you will worship. What's the question? Not if you will worship, but what you will worship. Do you see that? We're going to worship something. The question is what will it be? I've made a short list, and I don't know what yours is, but let's start off with the one on the screen now. Maybe your hobby. Could it be your sport? Could it be your family? Wow, could it be your child? Did you know that there are some Christian parents that find themselves worshiping their children? Children become the center we call it child-centered parenting. You want to be careful. The children are to come join your family, not suddenly take over your family. Be careful of that. Or it could be your grandchildren. How about your leisure? Some people worship their leisure. They're just living next for the leisure. That, that's the next thing that they're looking forward to. It's what they think about. Or we could say it like this, your vacation I understand we work hard and sometimes we just can't wait to get away and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. God's made us to be able to go rest and recreate. But we can fall into worshiping our vacation. Some people worship their vocation. You get around them and all that they think about and all that they talk about is their work and, and their vocation becomes the most important thing to them. For some, it's their wealth. And, you know, you don't have to have a lot of wealth to worship your wealth. You can have a little bit of wealth and worship it, or you can have much. For some people, it's their house. Housing is important to us. Human beings need shelter. But it can get out of whack as we spend all of our time and all of our effort on our house. For some, it's social media persona. They spend time thinking about how to get more likes, how to project a certain person of who they are, always wanting to show something about that in order to affect the perceived person that you are. You know, the, one of the things that I think is so ridiculous about show, sh social media, and I've said this a little bit, is, is that, you know, it's funny, we only show the best side of things. You don't go, oh boy, I look really terrible in that one, I'll just go with that one. In fact, one day, I, and you all have probably seen this too, I saw someone out in front of the gym taking a selfie, and this person stood in front of the, cel in front of the gym taking a selfie for what purpose, I do not know, but they did it over and over and over again. Looked at it, tried it, no, and did it again, did it again. I mean, it went on for like 10 minutes. I, I, I just hung around to see how long it would go on. <laughs> not mentioning any names, not even mentioning gender. I just thought it was rather, very interesting. So, you know, social media. What, what about Disney World? We can worship Disney World. How about your pets? or your pet. Some people that just, you know, they're so enthralled with their pet. I've already mentioned children, so, I mean, I can mention that. What about your house or your lawn, your garden, your flowers? Ooh, how about this one, your politics? Right now, we can be tempted to worship our politics. Well, so the last one here is you know, what's, what's your deal? What are you tempted to worship in? You, you know, and let me help you with how you can determine what is it that you're worshiping with this next one, number six. So how do we worship things? You see, number six is this. We worship something by, the first one is adoring it. You know, we, we just think, we, we think about it, we, we, we kind of love it, we, we look at it, we 
we give it our adoration, adoring it. What about meditating on it? It's the kind of thing that has your attention and you think about it over and over again. And think about any one of these things, whether it be your hobby, you're always kind of working out. I, I can tell you that as a kid growing up right over here a few streets over, I would cut grass and I would make money cutting grass. And mom and dad helped me get going with that. Dad showed me, taught me how to cut, a, cut our own lawn. And then before I long, my brother was cutting a few lawns and I thought, well, I can do that too. And um, I, I bought a lawnmower, and then I bought a weed eater, and then I bought a blower, and then I bought a thing. And before very long, I had a trailer. And mom would tow me around town with my trailer, and I cut grass. Well, there's a couple of things that I learned. I started learning that, you know, Bass Pro Shops will send you a catalog. It's your house. And I, you know, I didn't have my own license, so I couldn't go shopping by myself. And back then, Bass Pro wasn't even local. And so I would just... I would get that Bass Pro Shops catalog, or I would get one of the other catalogs that were there, and I would start going through that thing, and I would just think about all the time the next piece of fishing gear or camping gear or hunting gear that I wanted to have, and I would, I would just think about, well, if I cut this many lawns, that means I could, I could eventually get this, so, boy, Lord, let it rain so the grass will grow faster, Lord, because I really, you know, and I, I would sit there, and so as a kid, it really started out with the train set stuff. I would think about how to, I would work over here in our school kitchen, and I'd make a little bit of money. I think I made like, I don't know, it was probably child labor laws violated at every, <laughs> at every turn. But dad was in charge, so it didn't matter, I guess. But, but, you know, I mean, I would work over there making 50 cents an hour or something, and then I would whatever, and then I could go and I could buy parts for my train set, and then that graduated to Bass Pro, and then it graduated to boat stuff, and then it graduated to other things. And so when you start adoring stuff, when you start meditating on stuff, and when you, when you start really desiring it, I'm not, I'm not, there's nothing wrong with a train set, nothing wrong with going fishing, nothing wrong with those things, but, but we have to be willing to look and see, where is my heart? Am I adoring? Am I meditating? Am I desiring? Am I exalting it? Thinking very highly of it? And then we come to this place of pursuing it. And as we pursue it, we come to where we're starting to sacrifice for it. If you want to know what you worship, what are the things that, that require the greatest sacrifice in your life? If you look at the things that you willingly give up for others, that, that will begin to indicate what is it that you sacrifice. You say, well, it's not even a sacrifice. Well, it's, it's something that you're, you're really investing in. And then notice this one. You begin identifying with it, that I am this. You know, I'm a scuba diver, or I'm a hunter, or I'm a this, or I'm a that. And we, we begin to really identify with those things. You know, I've met people before that as we, and you can kind of tell if you, if you go to some of the major hobby things or whatever, you, you know, remote controlled airplanes or this or that or whatever, and I know I'm meddling with some of you. You go to a garden show or you go to a house show or whatever, and, and you, you start to see people and they have these stickers all over their car or they have it all over their computer or whatever, and they're getting a lot of their identity. It has to do with even the clothes that they wear identify with this name brand of fishing gear or this name brand of whatever it may be. And if we're not careful, we, we, we start to identify with things that maybe are not the things that should have that much prominence in our life. And it's interesting that when we're really worshiping something, we, we get into sharing it very often. Um, not always, but very often we want to share it. Um, we become evangelistic about it. We, we become evangelistic about why I'm a Mac person and not a PC person, right? Um, or why I'm a PC person and not a Mac person. Some diabolical person put an Apple computer sticker on the back of my car. I don't know who did that, <laughs> but because everybody knows I hate Macs. So, you know, but, you know, you, you see the... I can't remember the sticker is for, for Disney World. You know, we, we got that plastered on the back of our car because, man, we, you know, we're the annual pass people or whatever. 
and I know that there's some of those stickers in our parking lot, and I'm not condemning you. I'm just saying, hey, let's all look. Let's all look at the things that we're readily identifying with, and the things that we, we really look forward to, and things that we sacrifice for, the things that we can't wait for, the things that we talk about a lot, the things that we start to see as ourselves. And, you know, I, I'm just kind of amazed at how we can so quickly begin to worship the things of this world far more than we worship the God of this world. And so it would be right for Sheridan Hills to say it's a high value to our church to constantly evaluate what it is that we're worshiping and say we want worship of God to be the high value of our hearts. Very quickly, I want you to see number seven. God's people worship both personally and corporately. God's true people both worship personally, and that means individually, but we also worship corporately. Um, The people that say, well, you know, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. I'm not into the organized religion thing. I want you to hear the sermons of both community and the sermon of this message that, friends, I I just don't see that in Scripture. If you show me someone who refuses to go to church or is very lackadaisical about coming and worshiping with God's people, I'm going to very likely question whether or not they are a Christian, whether or not they know God. And I don't do that out of my own self-righteousness. I do that out of the truth of Scripture, that God has designed His people to be together. And we are told in Hebrews, don't forsake coming together. I think when you're thinking about missing church, it ought to be a, a really, really rare thing when you miss church. Satan loves to pull Christians away and cause them to be lax. Satan loves to have Christian families get away from going to church and teach their children that, that sometimes church is second best. We have to watch these things because it's so very dangerous. We worship corporately as well as personally. I, I think about Daniel. Daniel worshiped on his own. Daniel worshiped even when the king said, nobody's allowed to worship, nobody's allowed to pray. Daniel worshiped personally, but he also worshiped, which will be the next one, number eight here, God's people worship both privately and publicly. We are called to spend time alone with God in private. Jesus said, when you pray, pray in private. When you pray, go and don't show your religiosity before men. You see, that's what Jesus was speaking against with the woman at the well. He was saying, I'm really interested in those who are going to worship in spirit and in truth, down in the core of who they are, honestly before God, not before men. And so we should have, as part of our Christian experience in our worship, a private time of worship, but also a public time of worship. It is right that we come together and that we worship together in public. Look at number nine, and some of you are wondering why did it take so long for us to get to this very subject here in nine. True worship goes far beyond music. True worship goes far beyond music. There are some people when they look at our truth worship community mission, they immediately think, oh, that's talking about music. And I would say, huh, it's talking about a whole lot more than music, as we're looking at this morning. We want to be a church that is determined to pursue the Lord in true worship in every area of our life that goes far beyond our music. Um, Occasionally, I'll be with other pastors or with other people or meet other Christians around town, and they don't know about Sheridan Hills, or they know of it, but they don't really, they've never been here, and they'll say, oh, so what kind of worship do you guys have over there? And I'll say, well, we're shooting for (laughs) 24-7. And they go, what? Yeah, we're shooting for worship 24-7. And they go, what do you mean? Well, we want to worship 
just all the time. Like, oh, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I'm talking about music style. And I'm like, well, I don't know. Uh, really gospel-centered music, you know, music that, that really points us back to the gospel like with every song. Yeah. Music that really aims at the things that are, and they're like, no, but that, you're not answering my question. What kind of worship do you have? Well, gospel-centered music that's, you know, re- you know centered on Christ, I, I don't really know what to say. Well, I mean, do you have drums? Do you have a choir? Do you have this? Do you have that? And I'm like, well, you know, the, the centrality of the message of the music that we sing is far more important than the style. And so we, we just begin to see that music is actually a minor part of true worship, no pun intended. Music is actually, fill that in, a minor part of true worship. There's so much more. Though music is very important. We see the great poetry of the Old Testament. We see the heritage of the nation singing. We see the heritage of the Christian church coming together and singing hymns and songs of praise to God. This is very, very important. But when Christians only think of worship as music, we're selling ourselves short, and we're actually selling the gospel short. You see, fill this in. Verse 10, or number 10 says, True worship begins with conversion of the soul through salvation in Christ, faith in Christ, and it continues through every aspect of life. In Romans 12, verses 1 and 2 shows us that. I want you to read this one more time with me as we think about what all is here, and then we'll be finished. Notice Romans 12, 1 and 2. And notice when this comes. The first 11 chapters of the book of Romans is all about salvation in Christ, justification by faith in Jesus Christ. It's all about how we are saved. So it assumes the total message of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins and causing us to be born again to a living hope where we cannot be separated from God and all the beautiful sovereignty of God in that process. So the word therefore shows up, and that is when it says therefore, it's talking about chapters 11, 1 through 11. Look, at, look what it says. I appeal to you, therefore, because of your salvation, brothers, so he's talking to Christians, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. So he's not saying bring your sacrifices to the altar and kill them. No, you see, Jesus' living sacrifice going to death negates all other death sacrifices. Now the way you worship God is through a living sacrifice. We don't have to bring a dead animal to worship anymore. Aren't you glad you don't have to bring a dead animal anymore to worship? And why? Because Jesus has already been the final sacrifice. So he says, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, set apart or holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You see, so when you're saying no to pornography and you're saying yes to right and pure relationships with the people around you, you see, that's worshiping God. When you say no to pornography and you say yes to what is right, that's worshiping God. When you say no to to just being enamored with all of the things in the world and finding your identity in them and you're, and you're suppressing the desires of the flesh for the things that are eternal, that's worshiping God. When you're making your purchasing decisions, when you're making the decisions about where you're going to spend your time, this is a living sacrifice. You're living unto God, a worship that pleases Him. When you're not being like the world, and that's what the next part says. Look what it says. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. And then look at these two words again. What is good and acceptable and even what? Perfect. 
Now, the only way that Christians can worship perfectly is because of the blood of the Lord Jesus. He was the perfect sacrifice that brings us into perfect relationship with Him. So even our bodies, the, the bodies that are waiting to be renewed and redeemed, we bring to God by His power a worship that is pleasing to Him. Our church should be fanatically obsessed with worshiping God in God alone. Not the things of our culture, not the things of ourselves, but Him. We see in both Deuteronomy chapter 6 and in Matthew chapter 22, we see this grand command. In fact, it's called the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is true worship. When we adore Him, when we meditate on Him, when we desire Him, when we exalt Him, when we pursue Him, when we sacrifice for Him, when we identify with Him, and when we share Him, we are worshiping God. Would you stand with me for prayer?